gives me great pleasure to introduce Anthony Geffen from Atlantic Productions, who is going to talk about some of that content that has so inspired our first speaker. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Geffen. Uh, thanks very much. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the productions we're at either in, already made or uh, are in the process of making and a couple that we've experimented with just to sort of try to give you some practical idea on certain types of production in 3D of how it can work and the things that can go wrong. Um, I work for Atlantic Productions. I was formerly with the BBC for 10 years and then uh, in the last 19 years have built up Atlantic uh, which makes, uh, on the whole, very high-end 2D productions and some dramas as well. Um, and about three years ago, I thought uh, that it would be interesting to start to work in 3D because of the opportunities that, that uh, it offered. And we were lucky enough to be one of the first companies to get uh, uh, some reasonable money uh, to actually start making them. We subsequently, which we'll come to in a minute, have formed a joint company with Sky, which allows us to look forward for several years uh, at projects, experimentation in 3D, to really try to push the, uh, the medium. So, uh, Bachelor King 3D um, was the second uh, collaboration that uh, we had with David Attenborough, uh, from the point of view that David has become very interested in 3D from a film I'll talk about in a moment, which was actually made before it called Flying Monsters. Um, and David suggested one day over a bottle of red wine that the best uh, animals to shoot in 3D were penguins, um, and particularly penguins in South Georgia. Um, I'm going to open, uh, the way we've got to do this, I'm going to open with a little clip of the film. So we're going to go into 3D, and then we'll come back and talk about it. What we had to do, uh, we had our main cameras were uh, uh, on a quasi rig. Uh, they were red MXs, about 4K. And the reason we want to shoot 4K is that on, on the on master everything on 4K is because all the stuff goes to IMAX, um, and so we need to have very high resolution. But the complexities here were that nobody really had this kit isn't devised to work in South Georgia where you have storms and everything else. So for months we didn't get very far and we just evolved the equipment. Um, we had a brilliant uh, collaboration with OnSite who at the facilities house um, and they constantly adapted and worked with us and sent cameras back and forth and things back and forth to perfect what we needed to film it. And we slowly but surely worked out how the penguins themselves would react to things uh, and, you know, but it was a very long, very long process. The, the nice thing was that the penguins were always very cheerful, uh, were always very happy, and were always happy to get very close. But it took a long time to actually devise the techniques, the rigs, and work out ways, particularly in storms, of being able to continue to film, because the trouble is if you've got a mirror, anything that gets on that mirror can ruin the shot completely. So it was a real period of experimenting uh, with the equipment. Um, and then slowly but surely we, we worked out different ways of getting the footage which we had very, very carefully planned what we wanted. This wasn't go and shoot. We had gone there for two or three months, wrecked, storyboarded and tried to work out exactly what we wanted underwater. And it didn't always happen, but we had to have a plan because we could, we'd be still there otherwise. Uh, because we needed to know what we needed, uh, you know, very close shots and all the detail. Uh, the interesting thing is that the penguins, I think, found it as interesting watching us as we found it interesting watching them, or the elephant seals. And so we would, gradually, we would have a group of about five or six penguins who would regularly watch everything. We had a special rig that was, uh, was built, around, uh, built at on-site that, that did some underwater filming. First time we actually used it, it com the housing completely blew out because you know, we hadn't got the spec right. I mean, th th this was, in a way, this kind of 3D filming on the edge. This is pure 3D filming. We're not trying to dimensionalize stuff. We're trying to shoot a film in 3D in one of the most difficult places in the world. The entire crew of 17 had to live on this boat. Um, and because of regulations, pretty much every day had to take all the equipment back 
and, and literally winch it back onto the island. Eventually, we got permission from the government uh, to allow us to stay on the island, which made a huge amount of difference. Um, but it was, it, was, it was a very technically complicated. I'm not going to show this because I'm going to move on to the next one. Anyway, so you, you got an idea that natural history is not easy. Natural history, if you do it, needs to be very carefully planned. It needs to be thought through. It probably needs to be scripted, which is unusual for a natural history film. Uh, but it really needs to be thought through. And you need to pick the right species as the equipment is right now. So going a step back, um, last year I spoke a little bit about this, but I'm going to briefly talk about it again because I think it throws up some important things about 3D. The power of 3D is often that you can completely control it, uh, and that's why animation is so nice. But if, you, if you've got live action and you've got animation, that's a quite an interesting other world to work in. Our first 3D film was... Um, with David Attenborough was called Flying Monsters 3D, um, which had a life and was obviously for Sky, has had a life elsewhere in the world and is now in 60 IMAX cinemas around the world and really doing quite well. And, and that's interesting because I think there's a model between the certain types of films that, that revenue can come back through the IMAX, which has till now been quite a closed shop. If we could just have a quick clip of that. Now, the great, the great thing about um, Flying Monsters was that it pushed us to use all sorts of different techniques and try to play with things like that second sequence there, where, because you've got this, as we all know, this great depth, I don't think people are playing enough, and we're now really beginning to think about how to use it, the depth of, of, of having things appearing, and that you can keep the same shot, but you can have things in, appearing in and around you in, a, in, in you know, potentially quite an inventive way. People are just not using, I don't think, nearly enough. I mean, it's, it's all very well for us to say that. We've taken a while to get there ourselves. But that's an area that that sequence just shows, the tip of a potential. Anyway, it was all, all our research was based on, on, uh, on, on real, uh, unlike uh, Avatar, real things and real footprints and things, which made it interesting with, with the uh, CGI. But obviously, what we were doing is constantly integrating it with real locations and comparisons so that people could understand it. But to give you an idea of the complexities, I mean, I think our kit, that, that was a, there were reds we were using on a Quasar rig. That broke the most expensive, as far as I can remember, uh, cine, cinema rig that we could get hold of when we were doing a sequence. It was very heavy. Nothing's made often for 3D when you need it. Again, the same with helicopter rigs. We had to be very inventive. There are many more now. Again, the thing I'd impart about this film is everything was storyboarded because we were in... This is a younger Attenborough, of course. We wouldn't want to put in CGI before we did a shot and a preview, an older Attenborough. So this is, a, this, is, this, is, uh, this is David preview. But every single shot was absolutely thought through because we had to integrate, obviously, live action with um, animation and creatures. David wanted to do this in a hang glider, um, but the insurance company said we couldn't have a national treasure dangling uh, above Lyme Regis. So we put him in a, uh, a glider. Um, I'm actually not going to show that sequence, but th 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 this was the effect we, want we wanted. We wanted to play with the idea of size and scale um, and the real and the unreal. But this is the largest creature ever to fly, Quetzalcoatlus, uh, flying with David Attenborough and Lyme Regis, but it gives some idea. And in the 3D, you can play with things you couldn't normally, I think, play quite, quite so well with. Um, Animation is absolutely critical, and we had quite a job because Avatar had just come out that we had to make sure our animation was up to scratch. Um, and we luckily have a company, uh, a sister company called Zoo, who work with some of the best animators in the world and have learned a lot about 3D. And that, that, just never underestimate what you can, can learn from, from the animation world and how they preview that world to, to bring it back to 3D. They helped to draw up the models with scientists and then obviously create them in the different, the different phases. OK, so while we were filming uh, Flying Monsters, uh, David and I thought that the world we should really look in next, after Penguins, which we were already shooting, uh, was the macro world. Because the macro world, we felt, and the little glimpses we'd had of it uh, while we were doing the other films, were so extraordinary that we thought, this has got to be a great world. At that time, like with the other worlds that we've been in, in South Georgia, there was some technology available for macro, but it meant pooling with fantastic facility houses and experts who 
some of whom you'll hear and think in the next se se session, uh, and very good uh, historiographers, as to how to capture lots of the complexities of that world. But here I'm going to concentrate on the overview of, of the Q film, which was to enter another world. Now, where could we do that? Because if we were to go around the world, we'd run out of money, because moving these ca expensive cameras around is very complicated. So we decided, um, don't give us the clip yet, we decided that we would shoot the whole thing in Kew Gardens because 85%, in fact, nearly 90% of all species of plants are represented there. So here, there we had one place we could concentrate on for a year and a bit and find different ways of bringing the world alive. Here's a little clip from the series that will be on Sky in May. So... Um, what we wanted to do, literally, was to then to sort of skim the plant world in different ways. So many things that are interesting happen on what we know is, or we came to know this, is plant time. In other words, they happen over several months or several weeks, or they happen at night. Or, and so that, those are the things we wanted to capture. So we had to develop different techniques and different size cameras. Not, we didn't develop the cameras. We had to put the cameras together, obviously, and work out how they would work to capture the different levels of things that were going on in the plant world. And we divided the film into, obviously, the wet zone and the dry zone, and then a whole, uh, another film on, on things that you never see uh, or will ever see uh, that you can see in 3D. So, I mean, that, that just shows you the taste of that uh, massively magnified seed. But these are great environments for 3D. I mean, you can fly in and around them like being on another planet. Doesn't mean we didn't use the big rigs and break them again. Um, we needed those for the sort of scale because we wanted, we wanted to give the idea that it was in a place. This was all happening in one place, but that it was all happening in the sort of micro worlds of that place. Um, and then we, we obviously used the, large, the larger rig here, which is, uh, I think this is, well, I can't even remember what this one is, but anyway, I shall come back to that in a minute. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's, the, it's the Alexa, Ari Alexa. Um, with a quasar rig, I think. Um, but David, of course, came... The nice thing for David is he lives in Richmond, so he could keep coming in and out of these worlds and linking them. Now, the interesting thing is, you'd have thought Q was a doddle for lighting, but actually 3D lighting is another whole thing, getting depth, getting, get, getting the feeling of looking all the way through. So we, I don't think I've ever spent so much on a film in terms of lighting. We pumped light into these glass houses to, or, or, or actually you know, darken them out to go down to a degree. It was a nightmare. In a way, it was one of the worst places. And of course, for sound, it's terrible. Not that sound mattered much with this film because every, every second a plane flies over. But otherwise, it was a great environment. Um, and we used periscope cameras, and we used, we used um, which you'd be familiar with, I'm sure, uh, the, the 7Ds, and strapped those together. Um, we, had, we had to know. This is my favorite uh, character at Q called Bert. Um, who is a water dragon who is brought in to clean up some of the pests in the Diana house. Um, and um, the day I got there, Bert was in fact taken away uh, because he had, there are three families and he had impregnated all the other females at once. Uh, so Bert was ejected. Uh, but there's a special tribute in one of the films to Bert in 3D. Uh, there we go. Um, another quick clip from Q. So I think, um, for us anyway, uh, Kingdom of Plants is going to open up a new, our eyes anyway, in, in, in the macro world. And we're now planning quite a lot of things in the macro world. It's a fantastic world. It's quite difficult to get right. And it looks easy. But in fact, it's not. And it needs lots of very skilled people around you to make sure it works properly. It's very easy to think you just get out a set of GoPros and shove it on a plant and it all happens. Um, and it does if you just want to watch it on a very small screen, but not if you want to watch it on an iMac screen. So something completely different. One of the things we're doing uh, at Colossus is looking at different ways of where we can use equipment and how it might look. And we did a short test uh, on a climber that I'd been um, up most of Everest with, a guy called Leah Holding, who free climbs which means every time he climbs, he's got no ropes. If he falls, he dies. Um, very, very interesting character. And here's a little clip 
Uh, not really necessarily finished because we don't always take them to, you know, because they're not for transmission, but I think shows the potential. And we did all this in a day. You're going to see a tiny little clip of it. But we decided, right, let's give ourselves one day to make a film. And this is the film we're going to make. It's only going to be a seven-minute film, but we'll just make it in one day rather than the year that we're making the others in. Can we have a clip of Leo? Basically, the experiment, you know, we didn't produce perfect 3D, but what we showed, I think, is that that's a pretty interesting place to be with, with, with 3D uh, technology. So um, the, we're off, because uh, we don't want to stop working, with, we love working with Attenborough, we're off, in fact, to combine, if you think, all the skills that we put together on the three previous films in one big special three-part series, which will be coming at Christmas time, which is in Galapagos, uh, where we've had to develop Again, different underwater cameras that will work, well, different systems that will work underwater uh, and deal with a lot more, variety, or much bigger variety of animals in, in, a, in a different way. And again, we're going to utilize CGI in an interesting way. And my belief about the animal world is we can look at it in 3D in a different and interesting way that isn't always just the way we see it. So with the plants, for example, we have a whole sequence in there where we have the world according to a bee. And so you can see what it's like to be a bee. Well, with Galapagos, we're going to push those techniques and technology to another level, I hope. Um, but the, the really exciting thing, I think, is that uh, we're lucky enough to have a, a very good partnership with Sky, who is, after all, the only channel at the moment uh, in Britain and one of the few channels, proper channels, functioning around the world who have been very supportive to us. And we work with a group of very skilled people, including people like OnSite, uh, we work very closely with in terms of all the emerging technology and the whole production process, which is vital. But I want to send one message, which is that actually this is, you know, in a way you could say the high end of 3D making, but I think there are a lot of opportunities. I think the last few months have seen, have knocked 3D because bad, rather badly dimensionalized feature films have come out or rather bad 3D film f films have come out and, and everybody says 3D is dead. Well, 3D is absolutely not dead. And anyone who believes that uh, is, is, is just you know, not looking into the future. It's not everything, but it is very exciting. And I think it's going to emerge, not just with television, but I think it's going to emerge. We're just doing some stuff now with Nintendo, which is very cool, no glasses 3D stuff, which I think is going to hit a pretty big market. We're also not, I don't think we're far away from the tablets going into some kind of 3D. And I think there's a great opportunity in the 3D area to really push the bounds you don't have to make the high and expensive films you can make. We've just made a, a, an animation with someone who used to be at Disney on a completely different price point uh, and played and actually broken the rules with it because it, it distorts things in an interesting way. So I think, I know it's not, I think a few years ago it was all beefed up to be too much. It was sort of going to be everything. I don't think anybody who was working in the business ever thought that would be the case. That was the press, the hype, the media. It's a very exciting medium to work in. We would never give up working in 2D at Atlantic, but we love this medium for lots of things. And I think everybody should get out and experiment, work with that depth, break a few rules, and just let your minds race because 3D, if it's going to work, has to be different. It has to be different. It has to be something that you look at and you think, wow, that was worth getting that television for, paying the extra five bucks to go to the cinema, or downloading the game in 3D. So I, I urge everybody to think creatively and push the bounds. I think we're going to be able to get more negative space, hopefully, through broadcasters soon. I think we're going to be able to get more negative space, certainly in the cinema. Certainly our films, when they go to IMAX, can sometimes come out and hit you in the face. And I think, I think there's a great opportunity. So I'll take any questions anybody would like. Thank you.